So hopefully be able to get through um, chapter one. Man, we seem to be doing chapter one forever. And then get to the, get to the good stuff. And start with history. I really like talking about the history of chemistry because I think it, it helps, um, helps the lesson sink in a little bit when you realize that, um, yeah, maybe I didn't understand this, but hey, nobody understood this, you know, like 150 years ago. So, you know, we're all, we're all in the same boat. So I think last time we left with this particular um, problem. Did, did, did anyone go ahead and, and, and try and work this one out? Um, no. <laughs> oh dear. Okay. All right. So basic, basic um, conversion of, 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 of units problem, that, which you're going to be getting a lot of. So we might as well get used to doing them. So classic example of, you know, someone in Europe using, using the metric system and someone in the U.S. using feet and inches. And so, you know, there's, there's, there's going to be a problem. So you're going to have to convert units here. And so let's go and do it together. So we have a couple pieces of information here. I'm seeing a blank page. Yep. That's the point. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. So a couple pieces of information here. One is that one chair takes 31.5 square feet of fabric to upholster. And the other piece of information was that when they get a bolt of fabric in from the Netherlands, one bolt of fabric is 200 square meters is one bolt of fabric. So the question is, if you have a bolt of fabric, how many chairs can you then upholster? So obviously the issue is I've got meters, I'm deal, we're dealing with area here, right? Obviously we're not dealing just with length, we're dealing with area. Uh, how, much, uh, how much is a bolt? One bolt is basically just a big roll of fabric. It's just, oh, okay. just, it's just what they call um, a roll of fabric in the trade. Is, is called a bolt. And so it's a big, really long piece of fabric. So you, if you're like, you know, making dresses or clothes or upholstering fabric or whatever, you would buy a lot at one time. So you need to convert meters squared to feet squared. And I think the other piece of information that was given, so you could do the conversion, was that one meter was equal to 3.281 feet. So we're going to use this bit of information to do the conversion for us. Okay. So one problem that I see students making over and over again is when you're dealing with either area or volume. Remember here we've got area. So it's length squared and we're dealing with volume it would be length cubed. So if we're going to change 35.1 feet squared and, and then convert that to uh, meters, so let's put our one meter here and our 3.281 feet here. Now, as incorrect, we have feet squared here, but we only have feet here feet to the first. So what we need to do is square the entire thing. So we square both the top and the bottom. We square both the unit and the number in front of it. So when we square one, we still get one. When we square meters, we get meters squared. So we're going to get feet squared and we're going to square this number as well. Okay. So we need to square both the unit and the number in front, both. Because sometimes people forget to, to square the number as well. So when we do that, that becomes 10.765 feet squared, okay? So now I have feet squared and I have meters squared 
and I get two point nine two six one meters squared. So one chair takes up 31 and a half square feet of material, or now that we've made the conversion, 2.9261 meters squared. And this is another thing I want to point out. Keep as many digits. I, I, now I realize this has too many significant digits, that these two, these two numbers here are not significant, but I'm going to carry them over until I get to the very end. And that's something I want um, you guys to do. Um, you don't want to start rounding too early. Yes, Nicholas. I'm sorry, my internet's kind of cutting out. Did you mention already what the three rolls of bolts have to do with the equation? Oh, is there three or just they... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, one, um, so one bolt of fabric, that's just how much you buy at a, at a time. That's, that's so will we just... multiply this last number by three? So I don't have the question up. Uh, did it say it shipped three bolts in total? Is it three? Let me go back. Uh, three, yes, three. So at the end of it, we'll have 600 square meters of fabric. So we just multiply the 2.9261 by three? No, no, because, so let's, one chair is this much fabric. Oops, let me go back. One chair is this much fabric, 2.9261 meters squared. So, oh, erase, where's my erase? Erase, there we go. So, this is one chair's worth of fabric, 2.9261. And so I have three bolts of fabric. So that's 200 square meters. That's 200 square meters is one. So I have 600 square meters of fabric. And I need to convert that. What do I need to convert that to? What's, what's, what's my answer gonna be? Bolt. Feet? No. Bolt. No. Nope. Uh, chair. Chairs, yeah, I need, I need to convert it to chairs. So is that uh, uh, is that the two hundred dot uh, meters squared or just two hundred? I or think it was two hundred. I'm not sure. I think it was just two hundred. So, okay. but yeah, it should have been two hundred uh, dot in order to. So I'm gonna. So one chair. I need to convert to chairs. So one chair is 2.9261 square meters. So I get rid of meters squared and I'm left with an odd unit, but I'm left with chairs. So how many chairs is that? Oop. 600 over... Oh, uh, two point nine two six one. That is two hundred and five. Dot. Uh, that's it. Two hundred and five. Yeah. So two hundred and five point oh five. So what we would do is because we can't make point oh five of a chair. That doesn't make any sense. We can <laughs> upholster that many. So two hundred and five chairs. Would be our would be our, our final answer. Um, um, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, because uh, you are talking about the units, and um, I have another question. Mm hmm. Uh, I cannot share my screen. Okay. Uh, so. What's what's your question? So for so calculating the density. Mm -hmm. uh, I have, uh, like, for example, I have uh, 2280 grams uh, over 140 one millimeters, but you said uh, uh, we never divide. Uh, so what's the 
what's the, the unit above the uh, what's the unit for the denom numerator? Oh, so if you wanted the grams per per mil, you would just take grams and multiply them by one over mils. Okay, so no units for but one. But that is that's a calculation. You're not doing a conversion there, so you, you can you can divide. I said don't don't divide when you're converting units from one to another. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks. So if you were so if you were converting like grams per mil to like kilograms uh, per liter or something, well, that'd be the same thing. But um, if you were just changing the the units back and forth, it's always a better idea to multiply so you can cancel the units out. In this instance, we're not canceling any units out, so it's okay to divide. Uh, I I I was uh, when I was doing this, uh, I was thinking uh, I. Uh, you said never divide that, and was thinking how I'm going to do this with <laughs> no, no, just 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 for unit conversion. <coughs> Excuse me, Ooh, a little COVID there. Feeling a little COVIDy this morning. All right, so we've we've done a lot of this already, so I'm sort of going to go fairly quickly through. But if there's any if there's anything that looks new or or unfamiliar, let me know. And you know we'll go back and talk about it. So it may seem odd that the that the common uh, base unit for mass is the kilogram and not the gram, but um, it was originally defined as the mass of a liter of water. So that's why that's why it's a, it's it's a kilogram. Um, and the bizarre thing was until just recently. It was defined by a, a certain piece of metal. That's how we, we determined what, what, a, what a kilogram was. Um, so it was kept in France. It was like this, this cylinder of platinum iridium, which did not, it did not oxidize. It was kept under conditions where, where it wouldn't um, interact with, with the atmosphere. But you can see how ridiculous that is. I mean, if some, if some scientists like in Russia wanted to um, calibrate. Anyone know what calibrate means? What does calibration mean when I say that? It means a fancy word. It is a fancy word. But if I, but Cali, if I, how do you spell calibrate? Calibrate. So if I want to... It's like... Uh, to uh, calibrate is like to make something standardized. Exactly. Exactly. So if I'm calibrating a balance, for instance, um, I want to make sure that when it says 1.0000 kilograms, it actually is 1.000 kilograms. But until recently, the only way to do that was to um, go to France and get this cylinder and then move it. And then obviously that doesn't, that doesn't work. So just a couple of years ago, finally, um, a uh, team of uh, scientists worldwide came up with a new definition of a kilogram, which involves um, a force. And so it can be used anywhere. Um, you can use it to, to calibrate any instrument anywhere in the world. So much, 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 uh, much, much better. Make another platinum iodine in uh, every country? <laughs> well, yeah, that's, well, that's, that's what we have. That's what we have here. This is a replica of, of that exact standard. This one's in Maryland at the National Institutes of Standards and Technology or NIST. So that's what it looks like. But you can see that, you know, you make an even tiny mistake in that, or it gets exposed to just a little bit to oxygen or, you know, something else happens to it. Somebody drops it or, you know, all sorts of things. And even if it changes by like one out of a million, that's a huge difference because this needs to be exactly a kilogram. And of course, that's you know basically impossible um, to do. What was so, wrong with the water? Huh? What was wrong with the water standard? Oh, because it would have to be absolutely pure water for one thing. And how do you measure exactly a liter? Mm. 
So, I mean, you could get it. I mean, when I would calibrate my, like for instance, I had a robot at my lab at UCLA and it would, and I needed it to, it, it would pipette, it would measure small volumes of, of, of liquids and, and transfer them around and mix them and stuff. So I would calibrate that with a solution of pure water and it would pull up one mil and dispense it and I would read out, you know, 1.0000 grams. And so it was like good to within, it was good to like one part in 10,000. So that was, that was good enough. But if you want to, to measure something even more accurately, you would need extremely um, accurate uh, measurements um, of volume. Excuse me. Yeah. What's the, the, the meaning of that? I mean, who, who needs that, that accurate um, thing? Oh, lots of people. If you're, if you're doing like physics experiments, where you're, you know, doing calculations of, of, you know, forces and, and, and balancing different things. I mean, let's say you're, I mean, anything in the nuclear sort of calculations, you need to be able to calculate, like an electron weighs like 10 to the minus 31, 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. If you're trying to measure something that accurately, your mass needs to be accurate to like, you know, one part in a few trillion. So you can't have, you can't have like a standard like this. You need something that you can measure with extremely high precision that's available. I mean, this thing, as you can see, this thing here isn't available to everybody. So you need, you need a different, a different way to, to measure a kilogram around the world. That's the same for absolutely everyone. So we can all agree uh, what it is. So temperature, uh, we, we uh, talked, oh, we had another question. Yeah. And uh, uh, for, uh, for the labs, uh, is it weird to say a solid uh, is volume is liter or milliliter? Uh, mm -mm. A solid? No, volume is in, is in liters. Doesn't matter if it's a liquid, a solid, or a gas. If it's a volume. I mean, so uh, if it's solid, uh, should it be uh, uh, in terms of meters cubed or centimeters cubed instead of liters? It's the same thing. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I'm a li uh, little bit weird feel about that. No, it's it's, yeah. it's it's exactly the same thing. I mean, it's just a, it's not. If you have a huge piece of, of, of um, a solid, you would want to measure that. Like in the instance, concrete's measured in liters or cubic yards. I mean, it would be cubic meters in, in, in Europe, but yeah, it just depends if you have a lot of material or a small amount of material. If you have a small amount of material, it would be in cubic centimeters. If you have a whole lot, it would be in liters. Just whatever, whatever you can, whatever unit gives you like basically the smallest number, you use that. You know, so if you have a huge amount, you wouldn't want to use cubic millimeters because you'd have just some insanely large number. But if you have a lot, you would use liters. Uh, just because um, usually in life we use liters and uh, milliliters. And this isn't else... life anymore, man. This is science. This is this is this is real. This is the real thing. You're living in the matrix. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's talk about temperature. So um, I think we made it fairly clear that since we're using the metric system, we will not be dealing with Fahrenheit um, in the lab. We never use um, Fahrenheit for anything, but we do use two Finally. different we two use two different metric um, equivalents. We use Kelvin and Celsius. Cel so Celsius, um, the difference with Kelvin. There's no, there's no degrees. So you would say it's like, you know, 30 degrees uh, Celsius outside. You don't use degrees with Kelvin. You just say it is 400 Kelvin. Um, and mm -hmm. generally we, um, um, Celsius is used, you know, it's, it says here for civilians, which is like, we're no longer civilians, we're scientists now. 
So the other thing that's important about, about them is that the degrees are exactly the same between Celsius and Kelvin. Each single degree is exactly the same size. So if I'm dealing with a change in temperature, so if I have a change in temperature, delta T, and you're gonna be dealing with delta T a lot when we, we're dealing with gases and, and thermodynamics. If I have a change in temperature, it doesn't matter whether it's degree C or Kelvin, it's the same thing because the difference in units are identical. So if I have a change of 30 degrees, if my delta T is plus 30 degrees C, it's also plus 30 C Kelvin. C it's the same. The only difference is where they start. So mm -hmm. as we know, Kelvin starts at zero, absolute zero. And so there's no negative um, uh, Kelvin. It's all positive. And water, free, so water freezes at 273 and boils at 373. So there's exactly 100 degrees in between. So the delta T here is 100 for both, 100 K and 100 degrees C. So we'll be dealing with Kelvin a lot more when we, when we deal with um, uh, gases because um, when we're dealing with gases, when we're measuring volume and pressure and that sort of thing, it's all based on how rapidly the molecules are moving and molecules are always moving. PV equals NRT? Yes, PV. Yeah, we'll, we'll be dealing with PIVNERT quite a lot. So when we, um, the movement of molecules dictates uh, the pressure of a gas. The faster they move, the more they hit the size of the container, the higher the pressure until you get to zero and then they stop moving and then there's no pressure. So we're dealing with that with gases quite frequently. But like in the lab, generally, we're not measuring Kelvin because we, you know, your thermometer doesn't have Kelvin on it. Um, they have Celsius um, on it. So we'll usually be, do, when we actually do measurements, we'll be dealing with Celsius, but um, we may, when we're dealing with gases and some other things, have to do a conversion to uh, Kelvin if we want an absolute number. So conversions, like I said, pretty, pretty uh, uh, simple. One thing I want to uh, point out, and this is going to come up over and over and over again, temperature is not heat. It sounds like it is, but it isn't. Temperature we measure in degrees C or in Kelvin. What do we measure heat in? Anyone tell me? Joules. 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 That's right. Heat is measured in joules. Joules is energy. It's basically heat is the amount of thermal energy you have or a, a thing contains. Um, so I think I made the, made the um, comparison before that if I have a coffee cup with uh, water at 100 degrees C and I have a bathtub filled up and it's at 40 degrees C, the bathtub is a lot more heat than my coffee cup does. The temperature is lower, but the heat is higher because there's more water heated to a certain uh, temperature. So Fahrenheit, like I said, we're not really gonna deal um, with, with Fahrenheit very much. So really the only conversions we're gonna have to deal with are changing Kelvin and degrees C back and forth. And so what to... So remember that zero degrees C is 273.15 Kelvin. And so you don't have to memorize that. That'll, that'll, that'll be given to you. But this is the, the conversion. We just need to add 273.15 to whatever the Celsius temperature is, and that'll give us Kelvin. Excuse me? Mm-hmm. Uh, I just wonder, I'm just curious, uh, wh why did Fahrenheit uh, comes to place? I mean, uh, what does Fahrenheit mean? Fahrenheit, well, these are all named after people. 
So Fahrenheit was a German, Celsius was a Swede. Fahrenheit was the first one to come up with, uh, with a temperature scale. And you may wonder where the hell does 32 come from? Well, he started by looking at the freezing point of brine. So brine was something that you'd made, you know, you would throw pickles in or you would brine fish. It was a very, very uh, salty water. And brine, B-R-I-N. B-R-I, brine. Brine. Basically salt Brine. water. So uh, this, this would be water with a lot of salt in it. And as you probably are aware, if you add salt or sugar or something that to, to anything, you lower its, its, its uh, freezing point. Like there's a reason why seawater, the ocean doesn't freeze uh, when, it's, um, when it's at uh, zero Celsius and a, and a lake will because there's a lot more salt in, in the ocean. And so it, it freezes at a much lower temperature. And so he started at zero at the freezing point of brine. Why didn't he use pure water? I have no idea. B-R-I-N-E? Yes. Okay. So he started at zero was the freezing point of brine and then went from there. And so then the, the water boiled at 32 degrees above that and then it, uh, or melt it at, at 32 and then it boiled at 212. But, you know, with much, much easier when you're dealing with the metric system. It's everything, everything's in tens and hundreds and thousands. So it's much easier to remember all those different um, temperatures. Still weird to think of it as like it's a nice warm day outside. It's twenty five, but you know if you if you grow up in it, it 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 it's not quite as scary. So here's here's the difference. Just just one more time. Now just remember, a hundred Kelvin is exactly the same as a hundred degrees in the change. So if I if the temperature of something increases a hundred degrees C, it also increases a hundred K. All right. So that's and then really the only things we need to remember is where zero is for Celsius. And so if we, when we're converting to Kelvin here, all we need to do to convert from, from Celsius to Kelvin is to add 273. So what's the, what would be the temperature of absolute zero in Celsius? Negative 273.15. Right. And so, but obviously it's when you're, if you're doing like uh, ultra uh, cold research, much easier to say zero than it is minus 273.15 all the time. So that's a, another reason to, to, to use Kelvin in that situation. So, You've been doing these, these uh, calculations already. Um, so you can, you can derive a lot of different units. There's really only about seven different base units in, in, in um, uh, the metric system. Uh, so one of the ones we've been, we've been doing a lot is volume. And so the standard unit for volume isn't the liter, which is odd. The standard unit for uh, volume is the cubic meter, which is really big. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a big volume. We more commonly use the liter because um, a cubic meter is just a massive volume. And so we generally, if you had a cubic meter of water, that's like, that's a thousand liters. 40. That's a thousand liters of milk. You're probably not going to drink a thousand liters of milk at a, a ton. A at ton. A ton. A ton, it's a ton exactly. It's a ton. So that's way too much. Um, so we usually use liters, and so liters is one tenth of a meter or a decimeter cubed. That's also a thousand centimeters cubed. Is, is also um, a liter. So one cubic centimeter is one milliliter. It's one thousandth of a liter. And, we, and in science, we use this a lot, like especially in, in biochemistry, we use milliliters and we also use microliters and sometimes we use nanoliters, but uh, milliliters is basically the, 
it's it's a it's a relatively small volume that's easy to easy to measure it's the size of a lot of the experiments we do we do experiments at like really really small volumes so mills is basically uh, the unit we use there it all depends on, on what it is what it is uh, you're measuring but for the most part liters and milliliters or what you're going to be using like 99 percent of the time so again this just shows you again like how big a cubic meter is it's a thousand liters so really 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 big milliliters um little smaller than a than a dime cubed so if you get, a, get an idea of how big that is one ounce like one fluid ounce fluid ounce is about 28 mils. So like a 12 ounce bottle of something is around um, 300 to 400 mils. So yeah, here in the, in, in the U S I mean, you've been buying like, you know, liters of soda forever um, and liters of milk and everything else, but that's pretty much it. Um, like for instance, you don't buy meat by the kilogram. You still buy it by the, by the, by the pound, but the sort of, and you don't buy uh, gas by the liter, you buy it by the, by the gallon, but there's certain units you're sort of more or less used to, used to using. And the, the liter is clearly, clearly one of them. Density. Don't have to tell you about, about density. You guys have been, uh, doing this uh, for the for the last week the standard unit is kilogram per cubic meter which really it's 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 grams per mil um, which is the same number because you divide each by you divide each by a thousand so a thousand kilograms divided by a thousand give you grams and a cubic meter divided by a thousand basically gives you liters. So this would be um, like for a, for a gas, we usually give the, the density in, in grams per liter. For things that are more um, dense, like liquids and solids, we give it in grams per milliliter. Okay. Mm -hmm. So quick, quick question here. You guys can, can, can work on this super quickly. So galena is actually an ore, which is a, basically a rock uh, that contains lead. And so it has a volume of 4.6 cubic centimeters. Now, the density of galena is 7.5 grams per centimeters. What is the mass of that piece of lead ore or galena in kilograms. So I'll give you three minutes to, to work on it. Okay. And then we'll, we'll come back. Zero point zero three four five. Zero point zero three five. All right, you want to take take us through it? Yeah. Go ahead. How did how, how did you how did you do it? So, uh, six, uh, four point six, uh, was that uh, centimeter cube mm -hmm. times seven point five uh, grams per cubic cubic centimeters. That is equal to uh, three uh, thirty-five. Nope. We have two digits, right? Yes, we don't round until the end. Uh, okay, 34.5. Yes, grams. 
then right. you want to convert this to kilograms, right? That is uh, 30, uh, yeah, multiply uh, one kilogram over 1,000 grams. Mm -hmm. That is 0 0.00, 0 uh, sorry, 0 0.0345, which is 0 0.035. Right. So when you get to the very end, then you round. So then we would round this number to 0 0.035 kilograms. Right. Yeah. So yeah, premature rounding. We do, we we don't want to we don't want to do that. So this gets into our uncertainty, and we've been talking about this also from 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 the beginning too. So one point I just want to re really make make very, very quickly, I sort of made it before, but it sort of, you know, brings it in, is counting is different from measuring. It's the only one that doesn't have any uncertainty in it. So basically, you know, if I'm count, if I'm a, a sheep herder and I'm counting my sheep, I know exactly how many there are. I mean, I should know exactly how many I have. You know, if I left with 45 and I come back with like, the lesser number, I'm going to be in trouble. I mean, I need to know precisely how many there are. So I count each one. So one foot is exactly 12 inches. So the number of, of um, significant digits in that number 12 is an infinite number um, because it's 12.000 forever. So that's different. Um, counting is different from measuring because when you measure something, there's always a certain amount of uncertainty in the precision of your measure. There's no doubt in the, in the number of eggs in a dozen, unless one of them is broken, but there's, there's no uncertainty in it. It's, it's a precise uh, number. So yeah, Shakira. Uh, how would you do it? Like if, can you give an example like through, uh, through a question that we would do to kind of understand how it would be an okay. exact number? Like sure. what would we consider as a significant, as what we would count significant figures versus what would be like exact number in like a word problem? Okay, so let's say you had, um, mm, you were dealing with like, uh, if you were cubic inches, let's say if I had, if I had a, a cube, that was 1.567 feet cubed. And the question was, how many cubic inches is that? So the only, um, so you would take your feet cubed and I have my inches, one inch, oh, wait a minute, so 12 inches is one foot. And then I would cube both of them and then get rid of my feet. And then basically when I got to my answer, I would have that many significant digits because you would think because I've got 12, I've only got two significant digits, so I should round to two, but no, I use, this has actually fewer significant digits than 12 inches does because that is exact. That is a precise, you can't get more exact than that. So the number with more uncertainty is actually this one. So if you're dealing with a, with, a, with a count, you don't have to worry about the number of significant digits. You would find whatever other number in the, in the word problem has, uncertain, has uncertainty and use those numbers of significant digits to get your answer. Okay, does that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So basically, like, like um, the only precise number that, that that has a decimal in it that, like, offhand, is like one inch is equal to two point five four centimeters. That's exact. That's pretty much the only one I can think of off the top of my head that has like numbers past the decimal point yet is still an exact number. This is really unusual how that worked out. But I mean, it's, it's exact. It is, it's not um, an estimate. It is precisely 2.54 centimeters. So that's, that's one of the, 
one of the other uh, numbers that's 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 exact and not subject to uncertainty well uh, there are many like 3.1415926 yeah pi is uncertain so it's 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 however many digits you can get he uses like if you're calculate like if you're calculating a, a volume of a sphere or something like that or the circumference of a of a sphere and you're using pi use as many digits as you possibly can because you don't want you don't want to use like 3.14 for pi if if you have another number which with four or five significant digits just use as many digits for pi as your as your calculator can handle You don't want that to be your source of, of, of uncertainty. The same thing as E, right? What's that? The same thing as E. Yes, right? E or pi or any, any irrational number. Yeah, you use as many digits as you possibly can get. So I think I've mentioned before that whenever you're recording a measurement, that last digit is always something that you estimate like when we're looking at, at the volumes um, when you're measuring the, the volume of something remember that you know the meniscus is not going to fall exactly on a line I mean sometimes it will but a lot of the times it won't and even if it does you may think that it falls exactly on the line but somebody else may look at it and say no I think it's a little bit above or it's a tiny bit below so you always have to estimate that last digit. So for instance, here, we, all we can say here is that the number is going to be more than 20. So we know it's more than 20 mils. And it's between, it's more than 21 actually. So mm -hmm. it's between 21 and 22. So you some, you know, probably like 21.6, something like that. So that is an estimate, I estimated that that number. Someone else may say seven, someone else may say five, someone else may say four. But so this is um, significant, that number is significant, and this number is significant too because it's clearly more than 21. So that's significant, but it's clearly less than 22. So this is significant as well. Okay. So basically any measurement has one, the last uh, number in there is basically an, an estimate, yet it's still significant. So, ooh, 21.6, there you go. So two and one are certain, they're, they're significant. Six is an estimate, it is significant too. So significant figures I think we're pretty, hopefully we're pretty much familiar with. Just to sort of just go over it really, 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 really quickly. Um, because some people are still confused about which zeros are significant and which zeros aren't. So this will give us an idea of which zeros are significant and which aren't. So these first three are not significant because all they are is telling us how big or small a certain number is. That's it. It's just telling us to which power of 10 is that number. And if you wonder if it's significant or not, think to yourself, if I was to write this in scientific notation, would I use these numbers? And the answer is no, you wouldn't use these numbers. You would start at four. You would say 4.004500 times 10 to the minus one, minus two, minus three. That's how you would write that out. So the four, obviously is significant. This is clearly significant because it's the first non-zero number and any non-zero number is significant because it, it's telling you something. It's telling you, you know, hey, I'm a, I'm a number, I'm, I'm a measurement of something. These zeros are significant because they're in between non-zero numbers. So it means that these were actually measured. They're not there as a, as a, as a placeholder those zeros are there because they were actually measured as zeros because they're in between non-zero numbers. So these two are significant. 
Those two obviously are significant because they're non-zero numbers. And this leads to a lot of confusion. How come zeros on the left side are not significant, yet zeros on the right side are? And only once you pass the decimal place. You know, how come if I have 105,000, these numbers aren't significant, and yet these numbers are? Can anyone tell me why that is? Because uh, when that, uh, mm, that is, uh, because if you if it's not significant, you wouldn't record uh, record that uh, two digits for no reason. Right. That's basically yeah. That's basically that's basically the reason. They're they're significant because they're there. Um, they're there because someone put them there for a reason. It means that if you weren't able to measure that number that precisely, you wouldn't have those numbers there. That, those numbers there show you that that number was able to be measured with that amount of precision. So 0 0.5 grams is a lot different from 0 0.500000 grams. This number was measured on like a, you know, just a, like a meat scale or something or a bathroom scale. This number was measured extremely accurately or extremely precisely on a very, very, you know, well-balanced, you know, expensive calibrated piece of, 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 of equipment. There's a big difference in, in those two measurements, even though they're both half a gram, one represents very, very accurate number and the other one doesn't. So that's why trailing zeros after the decimal are only there if you can show that you've measured that number that accurately. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, uh, please don't, uh, uh, please, please undo that. Oh. Uh, okay. So if uh, I have 1.0500 times uh, 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, uh, 10 to the 5, how do I convert that significant? Uh, that uh, scientific notation to uh, normal numbers because you can't point put uh, uh, one uh, one zero five zero zero dot zero 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 dot because uh, I said you know what I mean. No, what 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 number did you have to start with? One point zero five zero zero times ten to the one point zero five. Zero zero. Uh huh. Ten times ten to the fifth. Okay. Uh, how do you convert that to to like the the normal normal numbers? Yeah, uh, you, yeah, you can't basically, uh, because yeah, I mean you can't you can't put a decimal there. So yeah, this this would just this just shows you that this that this number down here has five significant digits. And the only way to do that is to show it in, in scientific notation. Yeah, there's, there's no way to, to show that in regular numbers. Okay. You have to do it in scientific. And what's one of the reasons we use scientific notation is to, is to show the precision of these sorts of things. Because when you're dealing with massive numbers, like, you know, uh, if you're uh, dealing with like the numbers of atoms or something, those are always going to be huge numbers. So we need scientific notation to show how precisely we can measure that. Uh, that's the problem I got uh, for one, uh, 100 liters. Uh, I need to put it in 100.00 liters. I have to put in milliliters and I just get stuck there and I have to... Uh, convert that to significant numbers uh, so, uh, scientific notation sorry yeah just just go back no no if you, you don't worry about the number of significant digits until you get to the end so don't worry you don't keep track of the number of significant digits through all your calculations just 
I mean, because you're only going to get, you're only going to um, know how many significant digits you should report from the initial numbers you're given. So ah, don't, okay. don't worry about it during, during the calculations. Just carry as many digits as you want. Okay. Just get, to, then just carry like, you know, five, six, seven digits till you get to the end. And then, then you, then you round, then you worry about significant digits. Don't worry about it in the middle of a calculation. Okay. Yeah. All right. So should be familiar with this, hopefully at, at, at this point. So um, A, how many significant digits do we have? Two. Two. Yep. And uh, B, how many do we have? Four. And C? Four. 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 Right. Because, yeah, none of, these, none of these zeros are significant. They're just placeholders to tell us how big or how small uh, the number is. And we've gone through this as well. Um, basically, remember, when you're multiplying or dividing, whoever has the s smallest number of significant digits, that's the, one, that's the one you use. So for instance, here we've got, whoops. Here we've got two. Oh, damn it. Here we've got two. Here we've got two. Here we've got four. So like I said, just just put all the numbers in your calculator and don't worry till you get till you, you get to the end and then go back and see okay these are the numbers i was given which one is the smallest number of significant uh, digits two and then you see there's still only two so then i then i round not before okay i don't i don't worry about rounding or anything like that till i get to the very end in addition and subtraction Whoever is the fewest decimal places past the zero, that's, that's what we use. So we don't, so if we're adding two volumes, for instance, here, this has three significant digits and this has four, but this only has one past the decimal. So whatever number we come up with should only have one number past the decimal because we don't know 83.5, we don't know what that next number is. And so we can't use it to figure out two numbers past the decimal. You don't only use one. Same thing here. So we have a relatively imprecise volume on the top and a very, very precise volume on the bottom. But when we add them together, basically we're limited by the precision past the decimal point of this first number. So then we just round it to the first decimal point. We don't just add up um, significant digits because if we did that for the first one, 83.5 is three significant digits and this number has four. So if we were using the multiplication rules, we would say that our final answer should have three significant digits in it, but actually it has four, but only one past the decimal. So that's, that's why we always do our uh, additions and subtractions first, and then multiplication and division after that. It also gives us the, the right number of significant digits to use. And then basically rounding, I think we all know how to round at this point. One point before we, man, we're just gonna be able to just barely get to chapter two today. One point I wanted to make, um, uh, people don't understand a lot of the time the difference between accuracy and precision. When we measure something, we want to be precise. We don't know if we're going to be accurate until we, until we know what the actual answer is, but we can know whether we're, whether we're precise. Now, precise just means you get the same answer over and over and over and over and over. So basically, if I was shooting an arrow and I was doing it precisely, I'd be putting them all in the same place, but I may not be putting them where I want. So this first one is both accurate and precise because I'm getting the same answer again and I'm getting it right in the middle. Now this one on the end is basically the kind of measurements I don't want. They're not accurate, means they vary a lot. There's a lot of error and they're not precise either. 
So it's not correct and it's all over the place. So I strive to be precise. I basically, I set up my experiment to be precise. I, my instruments are precise. And then using precise instruments and using them properly, I get both precision and accuracy. So it's not enough to be accurate. Um, it's not enough to be precise. You want to be accurate too. But if you really had to choose between the two, I'd rather be somewhat imprecise and accurate. I'd rather have the right answer with a little more error than have very little error and the wrong answer. So here's, this will be our last question for the chapter. I've got three dispensers. So this would be like if I worked in a um, pharmacy, basically, and I was filling up um, cough dispensers. So I'd have basically a little robot device that just dispenses um, volumes of, of medicine. So here's my first one. So dispenser one spits out that many mills in five different um, uh, volumes. Here's the second one, and here's the third one. Which ones are accurate? Which ones are precise? Which ones are neither? And which ones are both? Have 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 a look. Dispensary dispenser number three is precise and accurate. Mm -hmm. so why dispensary do you say? Why do you say that? Because it uh, all the figures are stayed close to to each other. So they're vi so that means that means it's precise. So if they're all very very similar to each other, that gives you precision. But it's and, also accurate, right? Because and it is close to the accepted. Uh, uh, because right. they are precise to to point. Yes. So what about number one? It's What's precise, but it's not accurate. Yeah, it's also precise. It's giving you like two eighty three, two eighty four, two eighty three, two eighty four. But I want two ninety six. So that would be an example of something that needs calibration so basically i would you know just um flip the I, I know it's working well because it's very it's very very accurate it's measuring it's measuring very very accurately but or, or very precisely but not very accurately and that's my fault that's not the instrument's fault that means that i haven't uh, basically standardized it and told it exactly what 296 mils should look like so uh, once once I make that maybe, once I make that change, it will be able to do that, both accurately and precisely. Maybe it's uh, like uh, like the the instrument is old and and the the re the, 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 the what's that? The no, it, it, it just means it just needs an adjustment. Okay. That, that means that that, that inst if it's if it's precise, that means it's working well. It just hasn't been adjusted in a while. And so, based because an instrument doesn't know what a fluid ounce is, it has no I mean, idea. Uh, if, it uh, just it if... just performs a task over and over and over again, and so it's performing that task very very well. It's just um, you need to tell it what exactly two hundred ninety six is. So you need to adjust it so that instead of it going to like you know this spot, it goes to this spot. That's it. And then, it, and then it will be able to give you an accurate measurement. So what about, uh, what about dispenser number two? It's uh, spread out too much. It's spreading all over the place. Yeah, it's not precise or accurate. It's all over. It's 299, it's 293, it's 294. It's all over the place. Um, and none of them are near 296. I mean, one of them, one, it got one of them exactly right, but the other ones are all over. So... You would want to use it's dispenser kind of number accurate. three. It's no, it's kind not of... accurate because it's 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 got too much error in it. It's too much okay. error there. So dispenser one is precise but not accurate. So that can just be adjusted. Three is perfect. It's both accurate and precise. Number two, that's one you'd take back into the shop because it's all over the place. It's it's not 
accurate or precise. It's, it's giving different volumes every time. If it's giving the same volume every time, just a slight adjustment and it'll be, it'll be perfect. But number two is giving different volumes each time. So that would have to have uh, It means uh, three, three, millimeter, three milliliters uh, is too much, right? Yeah, if you're, if you're giving, if you're dispensing medicine, yeah, that's, that's an error of like more than 1%. You can't have that. It's gotta be, it's gotta be less than that. Yeah, yeah for, for, for measurements like that, you need to have very, very accurate uh, measurements. All right, so we're only gonna have about 10 minutes to go, but we're gonna finally get started on chapter two. <sighs> so finally get to atoms, molecules, ions. We sort of started this with our recitation last week. Um, but the one thing I want to point out, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, we wanna sort of go into the history a little bit to see where these ideas uh, came from, um, because you know these seem like bizarre, um, thoughts like, you know, what the hell is an electron and how do we know the nucleus is, is small and, and, and there's um, electrons orbit around it. How the hell do we know all that anyway? Hopefully by sort of looking at some of the, at the really early fundamental experiments, hopefully that idea makes a little more sense to us. So we've sort of looked at already um, some of the definitions of, of elements, and compounds and mixtures, where we, we talked a little bit about that in, in, in the last chapter. Now, an element only has one kind of atom in it. That's it. So you can't break it down into, in, into anything simpler by either physical or chemical means. You can do it with a, a nuclear reactor can do it. You can turn one element into a different um, element, but with a simple physical or chemical uh, now, physical means, you know, just, you know, can you shave it? Can you press it? Can you cut it? Um, no. Chemical just means, remember, electrons. Chemistry just means tr transferring electrons uh, back and forth. None of those will be able to break down an atom into something else. Now, a molecule has more than one atom bound together, but behaves as an independent unit. So an element will have, like for instance, oxygen and hydrogen are both gases, duh, uh, with certain properties. But when they come together to form water, the properties are now completely different. It's uniform, but completely different than either hydrogen or oxygen by themselves. So because now oxygen and hydrogen are bound together and behave independently as a group. They don't have... Um, the same properties of oxygen and hydrogen anymore. For instance, it's a liquid at room temperature. So compound, two or more elements combined together. Mixture, a group of two or more elements or compounds that are just physically mixed together. Now there's a difference between being physically mixed together and chemically mixed together, right? I mean, so a compound, those atoms are linked they are linked together and you can't separate them unless you do some, some chemistry on them. Now a mixture, you don't have to do chemistry on them. Like, a, like we, we're talking about um, seawater. We don't have to do any special chemistry in order to separate the salt from the water. You can just boil off the, 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 the water. That's, that's not difficult to do. Or if we have um, sand and water mixed together, just filter it. That's not that difficult to do either. But if it's uh, a compound, excuse me. Yes. If a, a, a gram of uh, graphite and a gram of diamond mixed together, is that a mixture? Graphite or and what mixed together? Diamond. Yeah, you could easily separate those. I mean, uh, uh, if they are mixed together, are they considered a mi mixture because they are both C? Yeah, that's a mixture because they're, they're, they're different compounds. I mean, they're, they're, they're different. Yeah, they're, they're not the same thing. Okay. So you could easily separate them. I mean, you could just, just <laughs> that's one way you could separate them. You could just, just um, drop the diamond in, um, in, a, in a solvent 
and it would just it would dissolve the 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 graphite and leave the diamond behind. Yeah, that's not that's, that's not hard to do. That is that is a mixture because because those aren't the same compound. It's the same element, but it's not the same compound. So if ice and water are mixed together, they are both mix, uh, they're also mixture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you can you can separate them, right? It's only when they melt when they become the same. Then then you can't separate them. But yeah, I mean you you can easily separate ice from water, right? Yeah, but the, they are still the same molecules. <laughs> yes, but if we can if we can um separate them physically then it's a mixture okay yeah so here we have three different things a b and c which one is an element which one's a compound which one's a mixture the second one is element the, the c is compound a is mixture Right, so if it only has one type of particle, it's either an element or a compound. A has more than one type of particle in there. So it's clearly uh, a mixture. So A is a mixture, B is an element, C is a compound, yeah. So we've also dealt with this a little bit as well, and we're gonna come back to it when we're dealing with balancing um, uh, reactions. But this is something that will be, um, we'll be doing um, a lot of is notice that we, when we balance, when we have a, a reaction take place, we have to have the same um, elements on one side as we have on the other side. We can't create um, new elements. Basically, they're just changing partners. So elements were bound to, uh, to one type of element or they were by themselves. Now they're bound to something else, but they don't just disappear. Um, they're conserved. And that must be true of the mass as well. So for instance, here, calcium oxide is, 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 a, is a salt. It's a, it's a mineral. And when it interacts with carbon dioxide, it makes calcium carbonate or limestone. When you see like a, a limestone or marble, that's calcium carbonate. And that comes from calcium oxide interacting with, with the CO2. But um, the amount of CO2 that interacts with calcium oxide, that becomes part of the solid. So I have a solid interacting with a gas and making a solid. The mass of my gas is then incorporated into the new solid product. So nothing is lost. You can't um, lose part of the, the, the gas in making of, of this new solid. No atoms are go anywhere. They are now part of, an, of, of a new compound. And you can see this very, very clearly here. So I have two clear solutions. One's yellow, but the, I got lead uh, solution, lead nitrate solution. I have a sodium chromate solution. You see they're both clear. Now when I pour them together, I form a precipitate. You can see that this mm -hmm. is a precipitate right here at the, at the bottom. One of the things, one of the reasons why um, lead was used in paint for so many years is it makes such pretty colors. That's a kind of unfortunate, you see this yellow color is really quite striking. It's a very nice color. Unfortunately, it's also made of lead. Um, so it took years and years and years for people to stop, like paint makers to stop putting lead in their paints because it just makes such gorgeous colors, unfortunately. And the other problem is that it tastes sweet. That's why so many kids had, um, that's why I, kids back in the old days would eat paint chips because they taste like sugar. Um, and that's kind of, so it's two bad things, right? I mean, it's, it's poisonous and it's sweet. So good reason to get rid of, of, of lead. But you can see that when, I, when we pour them together, the mass is the same. So we haven't lost anything. Now, if there was a loss of gas, then our mass would go down. But if we captured, the, if we just put a cap on it and kept the, the gas inside, the mass would still be exactly the same, okay? So I'm gonna leave there and we're, we'll start up the rest of, we'll start up with the history 
of of um, the atom and stuff like that. Uh, next lecture, yes, Nicholas. No, no, Nicholas. Uh, question. Yeah. Yeah, I had a question uh, about the still the word problem at the beginning of class. Um, wow. Okay, going way back. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I still didn't understand um, where the three. Uh, I'm a question right now. Um, I seen how you did the equation. I'm just not sure. Are we supposed to multiply the three total bolts of fabric? I, I'm just still getting hung up on that part. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Just yeah, I think I think you're just unfamiliar with the bolt, the term bolt. Bolt is just a measure of fabric. So one bolt, so one bolt is equal to two hundred square meters. Uh -huh. So three bolts is equal to six hundred square meters. That's all. So we're just gonna use the, the six hundred at the beginning of the conversion. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah, bolt is just a big long piece of fabric. That's all it is. Uh, uh, that's one one uh, one significant at least one significant figure, right? Two hundred meters squared. That just has one significant digit. Yep. Yeah. So. Yep. Yeah. yeah. yeah so it, it really should have. It should be like two hundred or something. Oh, actually, no. It says exactly two hundred. So we can assume that if that's 200 point, 200 decimal, we can assume that has three significant dig digits actually. Because it says exactly. Uh, thank you. Okay. okay. Yeah. So it doesn't say about 200, it says exactly 200. So that would be at least three significant digits. Okay. So actually, so actually, what we would be left with, so the the least precise number is this one. So our final answer should have three significant digits in it. Okay. Yeah. Because thirty one point five only has three significant digits. So even this was exactly like two hundred point zero 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 zero, then still our final answer is still limited to three significant digits because one share is 31.5 square feet. Yeah, Nicholas. Um, just one last question. Uh, how you mentioned uh, like the chapter one had a lot of kind of a history um, for Kim. Are we gonna get tested on any of that or is it just the measurements mm -hmm. and- kind of No, no, you'll get asked questions about that. Okay. More, that, that's, one didn't have much, but two has a lot of history in it. Two okay. has like the history of the, hit, the I want you to know, I want you to learn about like when the, you know, when they, you know, the, the discovery of the electron, how did that experiment explain um, the properties uh, of, of an electron? How did they measure the mass of an electron? How did um, uh, the, the, like the very famous gold foil experiment showing that the nucleus was small and positively charged? How the hell did that work? It's, it's important to know that because, um, it gives you a basis of how we know what we're talking about now. I mean, how do we know that the, the, the nucleus is small and, and positively charged? Well, it's because someone did the experiment, that's why. So I think, I think it's important to know that stuff. Okay, but not so much as like uh, the atom was first discovered in whatever date type of thing. We're oh, just- date, I don't care about dates. No, okay. no, no, dates, in the, in, it's not important. The important thing is, is um, how does that experiment, does, does the results of those experiments, do you agree with like the, the results of that experiment? Does that show what the, what the experimenter thinks it showed or would, would you have a different interpretation? Or how would you have designed an experiment to show that? That's what I want you to think about. I don't give a crap about dates. History is not about dates. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that is okay. not important. It's the experiments that's important. Yeah. Okay. Any 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 other questions before you go? So my my group, I will see you at uh, one ten. Um, experiment number two is posted. It's about chromatography. I want you to think about what chromatography means. And um, yeah, we'll see you this afternoon.